Hello, my name is Dr. Sarah Teets, and I am speaking to you today from the unceded territory of the Monacan people near their ancient capital of Rossowek. Rossowek is located near the city of Charlottesville, Virginia, in the southeastern United States, where I teach courses on antiquity at the University of Virginia. I'm honored to speak to you today about my efforts to engage in anti-racist pedagogy in my courses. I am a classical philologist by training and hold degrees in classics from California State University, Long Beach, the University of Colorado Boulder, and the University of Virginia. I want to be clear that I make a distinction between the act of studying the texts and material culture that survive from the ancient world and the academic discipline of classics. Of course, these two cannot in our present academic context be wholly separated, nor can I personally wholly separate them because I am trained as a classical philologist. This train in, training has given me certain disciplinary biases in my approach to antiquity, some of which I am actively seeking to unlearn. I will begin by describing in brief some of my own journey toward anti-racism. I recognize that as a white person, I am running the risk of centering myself in ways that aren't helpful. I am willing to take the risk because as Robin DiAngelo has written, we white people in the United States are socialized to think of ourselves primarily as individuals and fail to see the impact of our racial identity as a factor that shapes our experience of the world. So from a desire to acknowledge my positionality as a white American cis hetero woman and a desire to locate myself with, within communities and within broader forces of systemic racism, I will speak in brief autobiographically. I will then describe the aims and structure of a course that I have taught five times over the past two years, then describe how I incorporate some key concepts from critical race theory in this course, and I will finish by describing student feedback to show how students are able to develop their thinking about race and racism. I invite you to think with me about the question that serves as the title of this talk. Can the study of antiquity help us unlearn white supremacism in the United States? For the overwhelming majority of my education in classics, I gave little thought to the profound whiteness of the discipline. Though I would have agreed that racism was wrong if you had asked me, I rarely devoted much active thought to it, much less action. This changed for me after the 2016 presidential election when a minority of Americans elected an open racist and fascist to the presidency. The urgency of anti-racism increased sharply for me when less than a year into the Trump presidency, the University of Virginia was among the targets of a mob of violent white supremacist terrorists. In my efforts to listen to BIPOC members of the Charlottesville community, that is, black and indigenous people of color, I heard for the first time a truth that anti-racist activists have been saying for a very long time. I simply wasn't listening. The bigger problem facing them is not necessarily blatant white supremacist violence, though that is of course a problem, but the normalized racism of institutions that impact the experience of daily life, the police, housing policy, public school policy, et cetera. Yet far too many self-styled progressive white residents of Charlottesville continue to insist that the racist violence in 2017 is an outlier, that it does not represent who we are in Charlottesville and that the appropriate response is found in performative calls for unity. The same discourse is playing out right now within classics as an academic discipline in the United States. While blatantly racist outbursts within our field are of course problematic, it's the more insidious racism that constitutes how the discipline itself is structured that poses the greater problem to BIPOC classicists. Uh, the recent New York Times fe piece featuring Donnell Padilla Peralta has heightened the visibility of this issue. Um, however, Dr. Padilla is not alone in giving voice to this racial dynamic within classics. Um, and there have been many classicists of color who have been saying this for quite some time. To name only a few other examples, I would refer you to the London Classicists of Color, the blog Notes from the Apotheca by Nadira Hill and Corona Borealis by Vanessa Stovall. Like many self-styled progressive white residents of Charlottesville, too many white classicists in positions of power and influence 
have responded in ways that range from denial to silence to willful misunderstanding and misrepresentation. All of these responses serve only to maintain the status quo of systemic racism that defines both the governance of the city of Charlottesville and the discipline of classics. The situations are so similar because the workings of white supremacism constitute the structures of all institutions created by white people in the United States. And I would put money on some version of this being true everywhere impacted by European settler colonialism, though I am little qualified to comment on the situation outside of my own context. I say all of this because it is my firm belief that classics as an academic discipline is at its core a racist institution. I'm not trying at all in this talk to say that I think classics can save us from racism when classics as a discipline is part of the problem, a point which was eloquently made by Nadira Hill at a recent conference on um, race difficulties. Antiquity itself, or at least the texts and objects that survive from it, are not the same thing as the discipline of classics. My training as a classical philologist has given me many tools for studying the past, yet these tools are designed to be used within uh, set limitations. Seeing beyond these limitations is a task that is incumbent upon all of us to, um, to work toward. In this vein, it is morally incumbent on all white classicists to work actively to understand racism, its history, how it operates within our discipline, and what roles are possible for us in anti-racist work. Because of this moral obligation, it is important to ask, can the study of antiquity offer us anything in pursuit of anti-racism? To this end, I consider myself fortunate to, at uh, the present moment to be employed as a lecturer and postdoctoral fellow in a program called the Engagements at the University of Virginia. This is a series of seminars for first year students that introduce them to the liberal arts. These courses place broad learning objectives ahead of content or even discipline. This affords the instructors who come from a wide range of academic disciplines, a considerable degree of latitude in designing our courses. I'm going to talk a bit about one of my courses called Who Was Cleopatra? This course falls under the heading of empirical and scientific engagement which means that the objective is to introduce students to the practice of evaluating evidence. In brief, my course is about how historians construct knowledge about the past. And I chose Cleopatra as a case study for the course. I have had the objective of anti-racist teaching um, for about four and a half years, as I said. And when I saw the initial call for contributions for this conference, I found it a useful opportunity to reflect on how I am doing with this goal. Self-reflection and honesty about how we inhabit our own positionality is critical anti-racist work for white people. What I am sharing with you represents a point in the trajectory that I am taking so far and not the destination. I don't expect to ever stop moving in the direction of anti-racism. It's not a place you arrive at, but a process that you live. To this end, my professional goals include that no white student in any of my classes can walk away feeling like they have learned something about a Western tradition that they find superior to others, that by studying Greeks and Romans, they have somehow connected to a, a trans historical or actually a historical white heritage or that they can, like Sallust in the proem of the Bellum Catalinae, retreat from thinking about the injustices and atrocities of today through the more comfortable and comforting study of the past. I have attempted to teach classics in a way that pushes students to think about deeply uncomfortable realities in the present. So my question is, within the context of these goals, does the study of antiquity contribute meaningfully to anti-racism? To answer this question, I have relied primarily on student feedback in the form of written reflections that I assigned to students, comments made during class discussions, as well as course evaluations. I will speak only of broad patterns that I have observed over the five iterations of this course. To say a bit about the course itself and how it's structured, 
Because the goal is empirical and scientific engagement, I spend a mu a much of this course introducing students to some of the basic concepts and concerns of historical methodologies, including issues such as the difference between ancient and modern historiographical methods, the problem of the accidents of survival, what kinds of things even constitute historical evidence, etc. I chose to make the course about Cleopatra specifically to a large degree because I find this topic to be a useful way into um, the issue of how cultural forces that shape scholars and historians can have a significant impact on the knowledge that these scholars create. And the closely related issue of how modern categories and concepts can inappropriately be projected into the past. I get into this by posing the question, was Cleopatra Black? Sounds like a straightforward question at first pass, but of course it isn't at all. A necessary element of exploring the question um, as a necessary element of exploring the question, I introduced my students to some key concepts from critical race theory. These include the idea that race is a social construct and not a biological fact, the idea that race has a history, and the concept of intersectionality as originally developed by Kimberly Crenshaw. A core exercise in this class is reading and discussing Shelley Haley's essay, Black Feminist Thought and Classics, Remembering, Reclaiming, Re-Empowering, found in Feminist Theory and the Classics. I furthermore introduced them to some basic concepts from the critical study of race in antiquity, in particular, the ways that ideologies of race were constructed very differently in antiquity than they are in our contemporary context in the United States. I used Denise McCoskey's Race, Antiquity, and Its Legacy, which is an invaluable source and teaching tool on this topic. Critical race theory can and should be incorporated into the pedagogy of all academic disciplines. My experience with this course in particular has demonstrated to me the value of incorporating critical race theory in a course on antiquity. Teaching race constructs in the pre-modern world affords an opportunity to denaturalize white supremacism and the contemporary race constructs that support it. I have found that a great many of my students have never before encountered the knowledge that American race constructs are neither universal nor eternal, but are very much a modern phenomenon that result from a specific history. Most of my students are American, but I always have a few international students who have a lot to contribute to these conversations with their observations of how race ideologies function in their respective countries of origin. I have had many students comment on how surprising they find it, however, that in antiquity amongst Greeks and Romans, skin color was not as a rule, the primary marker of racial identity as it generally is in the United States. It's never been the only marker here, but it generally has been the primary one. I've had several students comment on how startling they find this because they're so accustomed to thinking of people as black, white, brown, or otherwise as people of color that it hadn't really even occurred to them that racial identity could be constructed in any other way. This has actually led to a difficulty that I hadn't in initially anticipated. I have found that some of my students end up considering the ancient Greeks and Romans as morally superior to people today. Some of my students interpret the fact that ancient ideologies of race are not primarily based on skin color as more advanced or evolved than contemporary ideologies. To address this, I discuss with them historical realities in antiquity, such as widespread slavery, imperialism, militarism, and other forms of violence. These forms of violence and oppression, which caused untold suffering, absolutely are bound up in ancient race constructs. So, I find it difficult to accept the idea that ancient ideas of race were morally preferable to ours. It's more that they were different and this difference points to the mutability of race ideologies. I will say though that I am not sad to see that my students moral evaluation of antiquity at least disrupts the belief that so many of them hold that humanity exists on some kind of continuous uh, upward trajectory of moral progress. I think though that the reason why so many of my students react to antiquity with admiration for seemingly advanced racial thinking is that the overwhelming majority of them are seriously frustrated and angry with white supremacism in the United States. And I have found this to be true both of BIPOC and white students. In my experience, 
students are entering the university with a greater awareness of systemic racism in the US than before. And it is surely because of the recent visibility of the movement for black lives, especially since the summer of 2020 and the murder of George Floyd. I welcome this anger in my classroom. Many students that I encounter are hungry for knowledge about racism and its history, even in a course on ancient history taught by a classicist. It's an opportunity for engagement that we should not pass up. I'll say a bit about ancient and modern race constructs. To put it very briefly, white supremacism in the United States depends on the idea that race is located in one's skin and in one's blood. As Annette Gordon-Reed has documented, racial identification on the basis of skin color and other physical traits in a white supremacist system in which myriad African women were subjected to sexual violence by white men is not coherent nor effective at distinguishing who was entitled to the full rights of white people and who was deprived of them. White male legislators created legal systems that distinguished white from black on the basis of ancestry um, in what is known as the one drop rule. Anyone with a single black ancestor or one drop of black blood was legally black. In my local context in Virginia, a law called the Racial Integrity Act, which was grounded in the one drop rule, was not fully repealed until 1979. So the use of ancestry to differentiate between white and black is a very recent and living element of American racial ideology. Ancient race constructs, of course, were not grounded in ideologies of whiteness, nor was, uh, were skin color or phenotype central to the distinctions that were made between groups of people. Greeks and Romans, of course, noticed differences in skin color amongst the many peoples that they encountered and noticed other phenotypical differences. And on occasion, they described phenotypical differences as marking the distinctions between groups. Yet rarely did they describe physical traits as the primary markers of difference. You might think, for example, of Herodotus' description of the Egyptians as having black hair and, and um, excuse me, black skin and hair that he compared to wool. So of course he observed that the people he saw in Egypt had much darker skin than probably himself and hair with a different texture than his own. But this phenotypical description comes amid an extensive exploration of Egyptian culture, history, and geography in which Herodotus defines Egyptians primarily according to their customs, their religious practices, and their relationship to the Nile. And this is in keeping with the broader pattern in antiquity of marking distinctions between groups primarily by lived practices, whether real or perceived. Language, religion, civic institutions, social customs, food and dress were all deployed in the business of defining boundaries between groups. Ancestry, whether real or fictive, also played some role in the construction of group identities. All such distinctions were also widely attributed to the perceived effects of geography and climate on local populations. Um, Denise McCoskey's work is an excellent starting point on this topic, um, and Ben Isaac and Jonathan Hall are also very useful, as is Rebecca Futo Kennedy's blog, Classics at the Intersections. Skin color shows up um, almost as often in discourses of gender and sexuality as it does in racial discourses in antiquity. So when Catullus famously proclaims his indifference to whether Julius Caesar is a white man or a black man in poem 93, this has nothing to do with race at all. He's essentially talking about whether Caesar was a top or a bottom. Now, I don't wish to suggest that studying antiquity is by any stretch the best way to teach students about racism and it definitely can't and shouldn't be the only way. It's critical for students to be exposed to, to modern histories as well as to critical race theory. I do some of both in my Cleopatra course and um, because this is critical context for our capacity to think about the past. Just like everything else we do, we necessarily interpret the past through a racialized lens. We have to understand this lens, recognize that we are in fact looking through it if we want to even begin to think empirically, which is the broadest objective of my course. <clears throat> 
In the feedback I have received from students, it's clear to me that they learn the most about racism in our present moment from assignments and discussions about the here and now. For example, I have them watch Kimberly Crenshaw's 2016 TED Talk, The Urgency of Intersectionality. And students express that this has an enormous impact on the way that they see not just race, but their own position in the world. I also have students listen to some episodes of the podcast Seeing White from Seen on Radio, which include interviews with Nell Irvin Painter and Ibram Kendi, among others, about the history of white supremacism in Europe and the United States. Students have expressed considerable outrage at what they perceive to be the, the um, disastrous failures of their secondary school education to adequately teach them about race and its history in the United States, which points to um, the real necessity of, of teaching this contemporary history at the college level. But in addition to their reflections on the contemporary material, many of my students have also expressed that studying race in antiquity has helped them think differently about race and racism today. Um, across the five iterations of this course over the past two years, students have reported that one of their most significant takeaways is that white supremacism is not universal or timeless, that it has a history and there was a world before it. Some have suggested that perhaps there could be a world after it. As I've said, I don't wish to suggest that this kind of education alone is going to solve the problem of racism or even that the problem is solvable. Education is not a substitute for systemic change and it won't bring it about on its own. Yet ancient history can, I think, have a role in consciousness raising. When students study a historical context in which white supremacism does not exist, a world where a fact of life that seems implacable in the United States does not exist, they're better able to recognize the constructedness of American racism and begin to unthink assumptions about its inevitability. Thank you very much.